Welcome to the April 2021 edition of the Zach's Quarterly Market Strategy Conference Call. It's a service of Zach's Professional Services Division, and if you're a first-time attendee, this is a live conference call that features Zach's strategists providing their analysis, as always, of the latest issues and trends affecting investors, the market, the economy, both globally and, uh, and here in the U.S. And joining us once again are Zach's Chief Equity Strategist and Economist, John Blank. John's going to answer the question, is investing in the stock market in 2021 similar to investing in the stock market back in 1999 and 2000? In other words, are we witnessing stock market deja vu here? And Zach's Research Director, Shiraz Mian, he's going to put the Q1 earnings season under his microscope and also address uh, the earnings euphoria that exists out there in the marketplace. And so if you have any questions for Either of our panelists, feel free to type them in the message field at the right of your screen, and we'll get to as many as uh, we have time for. So, John, we start with you. Despite recent dips, the stock market remains near all-time highs. With your topic in mind, are we looking today at a sort of hybrid of past stock market years? Yeah, Terry, uh, what I want to get into today is actual investment strategy and some tactics that we should be starting to appraise ourselves of now in April 2021. And one of the great uh, debates and dimensionalization of this period comes from 20 years ago. Uh, most of us, I mean, some of the younger people out there, you probably don't remember 99, but this was when the internet bubble burst onto the scene. And it started out with just a, a flood of initial public offerings which was the first financial vehicle that really uh, caught everybody's imagination. It was centered in Silicon Valley, which was basically tied to Stanford. But around it on the buy side was another set of vehicles that drove the bubble. And at that time, it was the Janus Funds. They were called the Janus Funds. They were based in Denver. And there were a group of guys who were buying the tech stocks that were being, uh, you know, acquiring huge swaths of the landscape during the internet period. And then later on, people flooded into these Janus funds and there was a circularity to the tech bubble. The more people put money into the Janus funds, the higher they went, the higher the NASDAQ went, the more people put money in. And of course, at that time, it, once the bubble burst, the opposite happened. People took redemptions out of Janus, drove, the stocks that were in Janus down because Janus had no had nothing to do but sell what they were told to sell for the redemptions, and that took the bubble down. So here we are again, 20 years later, with a scenario that largely feels like uh, this 99 scenario. The difference is we've got new vehicles. IPO is still obviously still the case. Uh, this is a great example of the first chart from 99 to 2020. IPOs, initial public offerings. And again, let's let's not go too fast to this slide, but let's just stop and think about it. Here we have close to basically 900 over two years, 450 a year back in 99 and 2000. And last year we had 410. Um, so first thing you should point out to yourself is this is half as bad as the previous scenario. And I think for the duration of this talk, that's where you should start your dimensionalization, which is we're halfway up into this thing. And there's no evidence that it'll just spike and stay here. It might run for several years, or it may well spike and stay here. So this is the tactics of the strategy that we're involved with here is what do we need to watch how do we invest as this thing evolves? What, what are the things we get to be careful about? So let's go to the next slide. All right, the SPACs, special purpose acquisition companies. This thing has swept through basically in the last year and a half, basically a COVID thing. Uh, I read this morning that there's no SPACs in April. So the, the big frenzy finally 
happened in March. It's probably over already. So here's another example where if you're wondering how far this is going to go, you're probably in the past. It's probably over as we speak. But this was an idea, and let's go to the next slide, where you basically give money to people. It's called the blank check company. And you can see in this uh, run-up over the timeline, this was, you know, in play for years, but so minimal that it didn't matter. And all of a sudden, you get $200 billion in this thing. So $200 billion in a market of trillions is not to be concerned about. Regardless of this thing popped or not, it's just not going to matter that much. What it does tell you now in April, which is more important, is the buy side is not buying these SPAC blank check stories like they used to. And this is something that's probably bearish, not bullish. And so just watching the SPAC capital raising should be a tactic of thinking about how close we are to a top. And it's basically telling us we might be at a top. Let's go to the next slide. All right. Here's what someone said just, just on their own. This guy, this fact king, yeah, he doesn't think it's going to be surpassed. So again, it may well be that the SPAC high is in in March. Let's go to the next slide. All right, this is fascinating. Um, now we're going back to 1999 to the big names of this period. Internet Capital, Congress One, Vertical Net, Purchase Pro, Vignette. <laughs> Internet Liberate Technologies, Ariba, Red Hat, Vitria, and Phone.com. Now, if you notice all these IPOs, when this started, um, six to ten dollars, fifteen dollars a share, they were pretty modestly and soberly priced. And then a year later, people were paying $150, $200, $250 a share for these companies. And the returns over that period, you can see we're in four digits, not three, 2,700, 2,700, 1,900, 1,600. So that was a phenomenal boom, right? Uh, the only two companies that are left that I can identify as Red Hat, which was obviously open source software. We're still, Red Hat was bought by IBM not so long ago. And Ariba, which at the IPO price of 14 or 11 and a half was 4 billion IPO. It went up to 40 some billion. It got bought by SAP in 2012 for 4.3 billion. So basically that's the best story you can get or two of them. One of the lessons here for now, which is why I bring it up, is really if you think about what was different about Red Hat, which is the one that really, really did work and the others that didn't, is Red Hat was a product. It wasn't a business model. Products that you can identify and look at, you should take and set aside as something that's serious. And these other business model things, you should be very skeptical of. For example, let's talk about the stock vertical net. Vertical net was a host of 43 business to business procurement portal portals headquartered in Horsham, Pennsylvania. So B2B procurement was the big angle of the first wave of this stuff. It was a a change in business. And they had a market cap of 10.9 billion, even though they had sales of 112 million that year. In 2008, eight years later, this company got bought for $15.2 million. So what's the lesson here? Well, business models, you're seeing this in FinTech, for example, right now. It's probably the best area where this has gone wrong and haywire again. Someone's saying business models are going to change. Uh, in fact, they may, but that doesn't mean a domiciled new company is going to capture that value or even extract any value because they're going to compete with everybody. And business models are ubiquitous and they can just change everywhere. So unless there's a real value prop around a given product, you should be skeptical. Let's go to the next slide. All right, top performing SPACs, Live Oak, Kensington. TPG, Texas Pacific Group, Longview, and DMY. First thing to note is the names of these SPACs uh, are tied to long-standing, very respected private equity groups out there that, that have been done business for years. First thing to note is the, the returns here are not in thousands of percents. They're in the 170%, 160, 150, 110, 100%. So fantastic returns for a year of time. A lot of these have sold off already on these numbers. 
but they're nowhere near as high as the ones in 2000. So much less euphoria here. Now, Live Oak Acquisition is the one that I pulled up, just what they had to say. And they said flat out on their own website, it's a blank check company, right? They're just giving you money to do all kinds of different stuff. And you're supposed to trust these groups. Now, you can see what happens here is they'll just keep on coming up with these vehicles, Live Oak Acquisition Corp, Live Oak Mobility Acquisition Corp, Live Oak Acquisition Corp 2, and they'll just keep running with it until basically the buy side stops putting money into these things. But my point here is uh, much less of a, of a bubblicious element to this than before. Certainly 170% returns is, is excessive, but it's not 1,000%. Let's go to the next slide. All right. So here's a fascinating set of nine slides of these post-merger SPACs where they went out and bought stuff. QuantumScape is the one that really, really took off. Just to give an example of what QuantumScape is, it's a research into a lithium ion battery. It's in San Jose. It has somewhere around 200 employees. And the big push for it is because Bill Gates and Volkswagen are involved in it. So again, here, what am I skeptical of? It's research into a battery. It's not a battery right it is not yet a product but in some of these cases you really do have a uh, bona fide products DraftKings, things obviously we all know that name but these other ones you can go through some of them have uh elements of technology or biotechnology in play but my point here is uh really look into these names we've got only one this quantum scape that did a 750 percent return the rest of them as you can see don't look as bad. Uh, however, the big line, you know, sort of, sort of DraftKings is like its main player. It's kind of been stabilized and hasn't really moved up in several months now. So it, it, in truth, the specs might be over already. Let's go to the next one. All right, back to the past. So back in the 2000 period, and there was this guy, Scott Schultz, who ran Janus 20. 20 big stocks. He got up 73% in 98. He got up 65% in 99. And he ran this fund for 10 years. So he's kind of the model of just, you know, who drove the first tech bubble. Now, to reference this, let's put up Peter Lynch, who is a great stock picker. It had an annualized return of 29%. So if you're just phenomenally good at this business of picking stocks, what you can expect out of is make about 30% return a year. So Scott Schultz was doing twice that. And you can imagine if you're doing twice what Peter Lynch did, money's coming your way, right? The same is true now with this Kathy Wood Arc Disruptive Innovation Fund, which was up 36% over these eight years. But you can see that up until 2019, 2020, Kathy Wood's Arc KK, the Arc Innovation ETF, which is her main vehicle, was not all that impressive. What you see is this massive 500% run of which 400% came in one year last year. So let's focus on Kathy Wood now as the Scott Schultz of the 2020 period. Let's go to the next slide. So remember, the only uh, there's only 64 funds out of 8,600. So less than 1%, less than half a percent. A lot of really, really small number of people can do this. But I only had four of them. They were all in the infotech space. But this idea of having a fund that produces this really came into play with the infotechs. Uh, there's no question about it. Next slide. All right. RK was um, up 150% last year. But let's look at this slide. You can see it came down hard early this year and it's been staggering around. This is a tactical signal for all of us to begin to worry about what happens. Janus 20 and Scott Schultz will happen here. Everybody who pouring money into this is looking at 153% return in 2020 and so that's what they're chasing. But if they don't get it and already she's down, you can see she's down this year, she's kind of sideways last few months, few weeks. When people start to get redemptions 
on stocks that are in RKK, this whole process goes the other way. So the point for you as a trader and investor is if, if you're buying stocks, uh, you need to pay attention to the redemptions at RKK, the names in RKK, and whether you own them. Because you can have all these stocks go down if the redemptions go up at RKK. So my point here is, tactically speaking, pay attention when you buy a stock if it's in RKK or one of our other funds. That may be the main driver of whether it succeeds or not. Not a fundamental story. It's about redemptions or cash flows that are going into this thing and not anything else. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so just in February 2021, just to make my point, the ARC added $40 billion in assets. So she had to put money to work. Now back in 99, I remember it was B2B, right? And then we had Red Hat, but now look what she's done here. She's got innovation, genomics, next generation, internet, FinTech, autonomous tech and robotics. So a couple things to point out here. Um, number one, this is six different sectors. Um, some of them are really flaky, like next generation internet, FinTech, and innovation, which is gets that B2B kind of thing. However, others are actual products, autonomous tech, robotics, and genomics. So again, take it from a lesson in the past, if it doesn't have a given product and that money is coming to scale the distribution and sale of that product, I think you should be skeptical of what's going on here. But one of the big things is the change is just the sheer number of things. Let's go to the next slide. All right, there you go. This is what I'm talking about. You are betting this thing's going further at 150%. Look what the latest, um, flows show you. Nobody's putting money in these things anymore. However, it hasn't turned negative. What you got to worry about here is not that it's staggering around and going sideways like it is. This is not a top or a bottom. This is consolidation. What you don't want to have here is this thing showing big redemptions. Because then if it's big redemptions, the stocks in those redemptions in these ETFs will get hammered and they will go down fast and it will create a cycle. So again, pay attention to the flows on this type of stuff and people will in the news media do it for you, but when you read and hear about RKK getting big redemptions, be ready to think about what that means for, for the end of a bubble. Let's go to the next slide. All right, Morningstar is a big follower of our competitor Morningstar, of course, on the RKK funds. One of their analysts is a, a very, uh, uh, negative on it and one of his issues is this thing about capacity what's capacity well the amount of money it's in the context of a fund manager this is the amount of money investment can, strategy can take in without compromising performance so what happens is you get more money when you're more successful and you have too much money to invest in the ideas and this creates a lot of problems that's hence the compromising of the situation so what a lot of times, I think Janice, Janice did back in the day, they just said no to new money. However, we need to talk about Kathy Wood. She's an ETF. She can't say no to new money. So let's go to the next slide. So back in the day, Janice just closed eight of the 14 funds. And they just stopped getting money. The guy had money coming in the door like there was no tomorrow. He had $170 billion to put to work in 99. And it was Janice 20 and 99 was 37 billion, just that one fund. So just an amazing amount of money. The only thing he could do is shut the fund to new things. So he didn't kill, have this capacity crunch. Now let's go to the next slide. All right. So the other thing he had to do, which is relevant to today, is he had to buy bigger companies, Microsoft, AOL, Time Warner, Intel. Too much money, he could only invest in large cap stocks. So the other issue here to watch for with the ARC funds is her original plays were in small cap, no name companies, where she had some sell on the fact that she had some idea about these companies and she had done research in these companies, but she knew them better than you. 
But as she gets more money, like she has in the last few months, she can't put the money to work in these small companies. She, like Janice, has to buy major large cap companies. And that starts the process of putting a top in on these, these, these risky, high, highly triple digit type plays. So there's another thing to watch out for is the, the types of stocks and how they get forced with the amount of money being put into them to become a large cap fund, regardless of whether they wanted to or not. Let's go to the next slide. So RKK, um, the, the previous average market cap from 2015 to 2020, it never topped 10 billion. These were, this was her play, which is below 10 billion. Uh, large cap stocks are typically thought of as 5 billion. So she had some large caps in the early, but never the big, big ones. Remember, 10 billion is not a, uh, even close to like a Netflix, which is 240 billion, right? The average market cap doubled in her funds in November. Now, because of even more money, it's at 35 billion. So again, if you think of five billion as a, a market cap of a large cap, the RKK quote innovation fund is now investing in stocks that average market cap is 35 billion. So this is not what it was, this is what it is. And this is part of that topping process is that she just got too much money and she can't put it to work on these little names. Let's go to the next one. All right, so now who's she buying? Novartis, PayPal, Baidu. Right, these are mega caps, more than $100 billion market cap company. So again, this has really changed. You know, her new positions are these big, big ones because she's just got this much money to where she can go. Next slide. All right, so there they are. Lo and behold, at the top of the list is good old Tesla. Teladoc, Square, Zoom, Shopify, Baidu, what you need to point out to yourself is all these names that she has huge positions in were the ones that ran up. And there's the circularity, right? People were putting money into RKK and it immediately got allocated to these names, which drove up their prices, which made her look good, which made more money come into RKK. So why does this matter? Well, Tesla's done basically nothing as a stock for the last few months. That's not a bottom or a top, it's a consolidation period. I can't tell you in meaningful ways which way it's gonna go. But you need to think about that when people start doing redemptions on RKK, these top 10 names, just for example, are gonna go down, period. They're all gonna go down together, right? So it doesn't matter what the business is, doesn't matter how much you like it, no fundamentals. It'll only matter if there's redemptions on RKK because once the returns don't show up, everybody thinks they're gonna make 150% this year on these things. They get minus 20, everybody gets out, the thing collapses, right? So that's what you gotta watch out for. All right, so another problem. For example, this little company, they own Ceres, ticker CERS, it's a biotech company, less than a billion market cap. So again, this was her in ARCG, the genomic one, AARKG, she had a really small position of 0.44. But just to get rid of this stock, uh, using a quarter of the past average trading volume, so being a quarter of all the average trading volume, just from her liquidating it, which means you know one in four shares on, in that given day were coming from her. She couldn't get out of this position for 52 days or basically three months. So here's the other issue on top of capacity is Kathy Wood, when she does get you into these little stocks, she can't get you out of them. And so if they go out hard, she might get stuck in them and you just got to write it down. So again, these are issues for thinking about in terms of, you know, do you want to own CERS if she owns it? You got to think about that. Next one. All right, there they are. I This is her list of names i mean later on after the call go ahead and pick through these things i'll tell you the few that i know crispr mvt i know editus and i know stratasys i know four of them so that was her original play right she could pick stuff like this that i'd never heard of 
But look at the days to liquidate some of these names. Some of them are bad, 10, 12, but a lot of them, 64, 52, 62. She's, it would be very hard for her to get out of these names if she has to. Next one. All right, same issue. So when Janus 20 went down, Schultz couldn't get out of them, and he stayed in them too long. He lost 30% annualized for three years. So this would be the scenario you have to walk out, watch out for our KK. The thing where she's staggering around sideways like this isn't this scenario. First of all, point out, we're not in a Janus 20 scenario, but once we get in those minus 30 annualized returns, they can go on for three years, and that'll tear out the redemptions from our KK, and the whole thing will go down. So this is kind of the lesson that you need to look back in history from. Next slide. There it is. So the difference here between Janus and the ARCs is these are ETFs. They can't close ETFs to new money like Janus did. Simply can't do it. So they have two choices. One is to put money on the existing positions and just keep going, build up the positions, which like I said, that probably is what happened to Tesla. The other is next best ideas, right? Which is again, having been a stock picker, I usually have two or three a month and I can play them. But if you ask me to do six or eight or 10 a month, I give you my next best ideas. They're generally not my better ones for obvious reasons. And so you end up with less good ideas or you end up getting Huge positions built in existing uh, positions in that ETF. She does both of these things now. Uh, and again, this is not uh, a thing you should like about her funds at this point. It's just if you're trying to get her expertise, you're kind of doing the opposite because of the amount of money she's forced to deal with. Next, Next slide. Yeah, okay. So blows up back in 2000. We all know the blow up story. However, do we know how other areas of the market did back then? For example, real estate funds were doing fine. Small cap value funds and large cap value funds did well. So there's another example where 2000 and now look a little similar, which is value funds start getting performance when these bubbles go down because people rotated the value. We're starting to see that already. The other thing to notice is when the NASDAQ went down that year 40%, the S&P went down only 9%. So it really wasn't a big meltdown for broadly structured portfolios that were not tech focused. So that's another lesson from that period to just keep in mind. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so there it is. That's 2000 to 2003. When the bubble went off, um, clearly led by the queues down, but there was basically nowhere to hide, right? It was just a matter of losing less than the tech guys. So that's the other lesson from this period is, if the boom goes off on these tech funds, you're not gonna lose as much money, but you're not gonna hide from the bubble popping, right? That's just what the basic point here. Let's go to the next slide. So, RKK in 2021 is down 3.3%. Tesla is now up only 0.5% year to date. So the NASDAQ is actually up 8% year to date on April 19th. So Kathy Wood is already doing way worse than the NASDAQ this year. How long will this care? People generally don't care about quarters or even half years or even a year. So I doubt this matters for a while. But already, she's not outperforming anything. She's underperforming her own benchmark. So the next thing you got to worry about is when do the redemptions come? Obviously, people got very different views of that. Okay, so here's uh, the small cap value ETF versus the NASDAQ. And again, you can see. This has gotten very attractive over this year, right? People are starting to play small cap value, not growth. And that's another thing that, that ties into the 2000 period. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so generally speaking, here's where we are in stock market returns from not 2018 to 2021. 
So if you had bought the NASDAQ over these years, you'd have made 125%. The S&P, you'd have made 75%. Phenomenal performance either way. And all I will point out to you is that the wedge between the NASDAQ and the S&P is wider and wider and wider. So you have to ask yourself, as Mitch Stacks pointed out to me just a few days ago when I presented this to him, is this is mean reversion. When does mean reversion happen? How would it happen? Well, if you look at this chart, mean reversion does happen when the NASDAQ touches the top of the S&P 500. It never actually went down below it, but it goes down to it. And so if you take that as a model, the S&P and the NASDAQ, you're looking at a 45% correction on Qs. That is what is potentially in play for a downward correction where it basically the Qs just track their way back down and touch the S&P before it moves up again. So there is, again, the brisk here with the ARC story, the Tesla story, this whole story, all these little companies, is that you get a 40 to 45% correction over a very short period of time. And that is what I want everybody to focus on. Look into your positions, make sure you understand where they're tied to Ted, Kathy Wood, and pay attention to the ARC funds, redemptions and pricing and returns, because they're all they're all the, the ball of wax that's, that concerns me. Thanks, Will. So I'll finish up here and head off the shiraz, but before I do that, I'm gonna go through the Dow, the S&P, and the NASDAQ back in the 90s, and then I'll go through the same three things for now. For the first thing to point out is, other than 98, 99, there was really no uh, strong up performance by tech stocks until those IPOs and those Janus funds got circulating together. Then they drove 2X returns and even 3X returns in 99. And that was a true bubble. But other than that, you can see 95, 96, 97, you know, in fact, you could do it better on Dow stocks, two of those three years. So this really was a two-year phenomenon at that time. Let's go to the next slide. I'll finish up here before I hand off your eyes. So now you can see 2018 was a year everything went down, which is point number one. There's no, gonna be no place to hide in this thing. They're all going down together. However, you can see the NASDAQ went down only 4%. The S&P went down six and so did the, the Dow. So not clear there's much of a story for 2018, but now you can see 35 and 43 coming up against numbers that are basically half that. So my point here is um, these are not as extreme numbers as in 98 and 99, number one. So this can and might likely continue for 2021. You can, we already get the NASDAQ up 8% this year, so it can get the 30% number again this year, which then you would have three years that were finally equaling the bubble of 2000. So the lessons here from just an overall returns perspective is it's nowhere near clear to me that it's gonna pop now, uh, but we have other examples of other clues that we're in a topping space because the redemptions are you know, basically static and the returns on the Kathy Wood funds are basically zero as they are with Tesla. So hard to say if we rotate into other tech stocks or more other stocks outside of tech and carry on from the year. I still think that's probably your better bet. But my point here is just to watch something mechanical within the ARC funds as another way to understand tactically when uh, you may want to get out of stocks or at least get out of, you know, real name brand ARC stocks. And with that, I'll, I'll hand this over to Shiraz. Yeah, yeah, let's bring uh, Shiraz in. Shiraz, we've seen a great start to another earnings season here already. Many upbeat reports, some even characterized as blowout reports. And uh, so there seems to be a lot of euphoria around uh, Q1 earnings, and we need you to tell us what's behind it. Sure, uh, absolutely. And there is uh, genuine uh, optimism about the earnings outlook. Uh, as you can see on this slide, this gives you, uh, in a big picture sense, the layoff land where we are now 
where we have come from and what's the expectation for the uh, for the coming periods. And uh, just uh, just take a look at uh, the 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 very strong growth we had in 2018, uh, and keep in mind what drove that. Uh, there was the corporate tax cut. Uh, uh, which we all understood even at the time that the pop was one off uh, and uh, 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 companies will have to bring uh, growth uh, from uh, from sources other than uh, what they got in 2018. So we had a flat uh, uh, 2019 and the expectation before COVID hit uh, was for a high single digits growth uh, in uh, uh, in 2020 and then uh, uh, what happened is is uh, in front of us uh, so the optimism that Terry is referring to uh, is what's happening in 2021 and I'll show you a little later how uh, that expectation, has steadily been improving over the last many months. Uh, and I personally feel uh, that given the optimism about the underlying economic backdrop, uh, we will see that momentum of incremental positive improvement continue uh, for quite some time. So let's go to the next slide. And this shows Again, in a big picture sense, uh, earnings, aggregate earnings, the, uh, the the dollar amounts, and these are billions of dollars. So when we are talking about 2021, uh, uh, this is 1,557 billion, so 1.55 trillion. And you could see here the uh, the jump from 2017 to 2018. Uh, that's uh, the, the big big part of that. The majority part of that uh, is the corporate tax cut, uh, and then you could see the drop from 2019 to 2020. Uh, that's your COVID hit. Uh, so let's just go to the next slide, and this shows you. Uh, what I was referring to earlier as the steadily improving outlook. Uh, so uh, again, we are showing here the dollar amounts and not the year over year change uh, to uh, to have a better visual representation of how the outlook has been steadily improving uh, since last summer. And that's uh, in in, in my analysis of real-time tracking of, uh, of earnings, as you guys know, uh, we track that on a real-time basis. This is bottom-up aggregation. Uh, I started noticing uh, uh, an improvement uh, on the estimates front last summer. Uh, and uh, and we, we, we flagged it at the time. We have been monitoring it uh, ever since. And I have been noticing an acceleration in that improving trend uh, over the last few months, particularly uh, since uh, since Q4 2020. Uh, so the question is, how much more improvement is in store here? Uh, and uh, to answer that, uh, you 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 should always be mindful of what's driving earnings, which in the final analysis is GDP growth and margins. And uh, the outlook for, for, for GDP growth, particularly for the US economy, uh, is, uh, is, 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 in, is in the vicinity of what we typically see for, uh, for, for the big emerging economies. We haven't seen uh, six, seven, eight, nine percent GDP growth rates uh, in the US in a while. And those are the types of numbers uh, that we see in the estimates. So let's go to the next slide. And, and this is a, a relatively more understandable version of the preceding slide, because here we are showing uh, the index earnings on an EPS basis. So uh, it's 172.80 
today, uh, it was as down uh, as 156 uh, last summer. Uh, so you could see uh, how much the outlook uh, has improved. And if we go back from the summer, uh, we had a slide down, uh, a, a very consistent slide down uh, from the spring onwards to the July period as we came to grips with the full impact uh, of the pandemic. So let's go to the next slide. So, so where is the revisions coming from? And as you could see here, uh, it's pretty broad based. In fact, 13 of the 16 ZAC sectors uh, uh, have seen uh, positive revisions since last summer. Uh, and in here, uh, I flag some of the biggest one energy for understandable reasons since last summer, uh, more than 200%. Uh, autos, uh, we're all familiar with the story, construction, huge boom there. Uh, and then uh, look in, the, uh, in these uh, deep cyclical areas, uh, materials, industrials, uh, and then finance and technology. Uh, finance uh, has had an amazing run in the stock market as well. And we are seeing a uh, uh, very impressive revision trend there. Uh, just to uh, just to briefly touch on, we have uh, a number of the major banks uh, in our focus list portfolio, JP Morgan, uh, we have Bank of America, we have held in the past Wells Fargo too, but not, don't have it now. Uh, and we have uh, Goldman as well. And in technology, you could see very strong revisions there. Uh, the, uh, the next bullet talks about the uh, revisions trend this year. Uh, again, for 2021 estimates, uh, and we see the same sectors, uh, energy, materials, finance, construction, technology, uh, figure prominently uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this trend. And the, uh, the only three areas, uh, two uh, really discretionary and transportation for obvious reasons, uh, since the pandemic had such a big direct impact on the broader leisure, hospitality, and, uh, uh, and the transportation area. Uh, the aerospace defense here uh, mentioned uh, is, is primarily a Boeing uh, story, uh, so not, not as broad of an issue uh, beyond that. Let's go to the next slide. And uh, so we saw earlier how strong the 2021 growth is uh, and uh, one direct response, immediate response uh, to that then becomes that uh, it is in some ways less of a worthy growth pace since so much of it is driven by easy comparison. We fell in 2020 and we're just bouncing back from there. And there's a fair amount of truth to that as I as I mentioned on this slide, that five of the 16 ZAX sectors uh, uh, will earn less in 2021 uh, than it did in the pre-COVID areas. And we mentioned energy in there, transportation is there, our discretionary is there, uh, uh, and even finance uh, modestly below 2019 levels. Uh, but then there are many other sectors, key notable major sectors uh, that will have real growth in 2021. And the growth is not a result of easy comparison. And I mentioned uh, and flag here the technology sector, the biggest earnings contributor in the S&P 500. And just briefly take a look at the sector's earnings performance in 2020. Uh, uh, Technology was able to achieve earnings growth despite all the COVID related disruptions in 2020. Uh, and on top of that, uh, the expectation currently is for a 15 person growth uh, in 2021, which carries into the next two years. We have similar charts and similar growth outlooks for retail, construction, autos, materials. Uh, and, and the other, uh, the major sectors. The bottom line here 
the 2021 growth, yes, part of it is easy comparisons, but then there are many sectors that are showing and achieving real growth this year. So let's go to the next slide. So Q1 earnings season is on. Uh, we, are, we are in the thick of it. Uh, uh, I issue the, uh, the, uh, the weekly earnings trends report uh, where you could track the real time uh, developments, the numbers, the trends. The latest one I published yesterday, we are off to a good start. As Terry mentioned at the top, uh, the banks had impressive numbers. Uh, a big part of that was the uh, reserve releases, uh, which is more of an accounting gain than a real gain, but it has read true for other sectors in the broader economy in the sense that uh, when these conservative institutions are releasing reserves, that's a comment on an improving macroeconomic outlook uh, which has uh, which has a positive interpretation for all the other sectors. The revisions trend we mentioned that earlier in the context of 2021 estimates. Uh, uh, we will be watching as we go through the remainder, uh, which is actually the bulk of the earnings season next week and, and the following, as to how that. Uh, shows up in terms of uh, revisions for uh, the June quarter uh, and uh, uh, and then Q3. Uh, I'm looking for more clarity and visibility, particularly since the vaccination exercise is so much more robust and successful uh, in the U.S. Uh, uh, my sense is that as we move into the more uh, consumer-centric sectors, uh, reporting cycles uh, in the coming days uh, will will we'll have more informative uh, conversations from uh, different management teams in, uh, in in a variety of consumer touching uh, industries uh, as to how those management teams see the post COVID world, uh, which will be very informative for all of us. So let's go to the next slide. This this gives you. A quarterly view uh, of the of the earnings picture. Earlier, we discussed it on an annual basis. Here, you could see we have Q1 flat in the context of uh, where we have come from and what's the expectation for the coming periods. Uh, a 28.1 percent earnings growth on 6.3 percent revenue gains, uh, and the comparisons uh, in the June quarter are particularly easy. Uh, as you would recall, last year's June quarter was the bottom of the pandemic's earnings impact. Uh, so the uh, uh, the comparisons are particularly uh, easier there. Uh, so the growth picture uh, is, uh, uh, is, is extremely impressive, uh, but a big part of that is easy comparisons. Let's go to the next slide. This gives you a summary view of the blended Q1 expectations. So what I mean by blended is the results that have come out, the actuals for those combined with estimates for the still to come companies. And then we contrast that with the preceding reported period, uh, both for earnings, for revenues and margins. It's a busy looking table. I wouldn't go into the details, but you could see at the Towards the bottom, uh, we have the S&P 500, 28.1% uh, earnings growth, 6.3% revenue growth, and uh, 200 basis point uh, expansion uh, in net income margins. Let's go to the next slide. And, and this is uh, the key variable and metric that I'll be closely watching uh, effectively in real time as we go through uh, these earnings releases in the coming days to see the magnitude and the pace of revisions uh, for the June quarter. Uh, the, uh, the, the revision trend uh, for Q1, the period for which we are seeing the results currently, was very impressive and represented uh, an acceleration from the trend 
that had gotten in the way in the summer, as I pointed out earlier, uh, and I'll be looking for that same or better level of acceleration in the coming days for the June quarter. Uh, to the extent that we get that, uh, will determine how positive or otherwise uh, we remain on the earnings picture. Uh, but as you could uh, 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 take away from uh, uh, all these slides, uh, that the overall earnings picture and outlook uh, remains extremely positive. Uh, in fact, uh, I will not be wrong to, to say that it has not been this good uh, in, in a very long time. With that, I'll end my, uh, uh, my comments. Charles, I just have one quick question because I know the clock is ticking here. You mentioned guidance from companies. You mentioned the vaccination exercise, but we have not yet drawn the line under COVID. And so because of that, will the multinational company guidance be particularly important going forward here? Absolutely. So it's the, uh, the U.S. Uh, is a key market, uh, but uh, many of these companies uh, uh, derive uh, huge chunks of their revenues and profitability from uh, beyond the U.S. So uh, the fact that uh, India uh, is just grappling with the full brunt of, of the pandemic, uh, that many other developed markets uh, are at the earlier stages of their vaccinations, uh, that will uh, uh, determine how these companies see the, uh, the macro backdrop evolving. Uh, the, uh, the, the very positive and favorable comments on the vaccination that uh, perhaps could be gleaned from my comments are primarily uh, about the U.S. Uh, the U.S. market, which is important, uh, but isn't uh, you correctly uh, point out is not the, the only place. Okay, and with that, uh, thank you. By the way, with that, we'll have to wrap up another call. Thanks to our panelists, John Blank and Shiraz Mian, and we hope you found their presentations informative. If you would like copies of John's or Shiraz PowerPoint presentations featured in today's call please email zrs at zax.com or contact your ZRS representative directly, or you may be able to access them in the GoToWebinar console after this presentation. And if you have any questions regarding our services, feel free to email them to zrs at zax.com as well. Meantime, we hope everyone continues to do as well as they can during this challenging time. And I know everyone here at Zax is doing what we can to service each of you as we uh, are all still working remotely. Many of us are. Thank you for your understanding, and thanks for joining us today. Feedback is always welcome. In fact, after you close out this webinar, you'll be prompted to fill out a one-minute survey, and we'd appreciate it if you would fill it out because we do use those comments to improve the quality of the content going forward. And as always, we'll look forward to the next time we're all together on the call.